But if you don't surround yourself with good people, and you're not working with good people, um, you're never going to be successful. This is Entrepreneur's The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing with Entrepreneur The Playbook, and I am here so I think my first movie producer, this is really cool, especially I've never met a producer who's also a Marine, kind of a conflictual thing, but Zach Iskell here with me, famous producer and ex-Marine. Uh, you know, I really want to get into professions. Yep. Because, you know, I, I think professions are found, they're not made. We were earlier discussing one of the few people I know that said, hey, I want to be an astronaut, and Mike Massimino became an astronaut. Yeah. What did you want to do when you were a kid? Oh, man. It's a good question. I think, you know, growing up, I always wanted to join the military. Okay, and I had a lot of family that were in World War II. I remember my grandparents were in World War II. I grew up Jewish from New York, so I grew up around a lot of Holocaust survivors, and I knew about their experiences. You're the Lieutenant, Jewish Lieutenant Dan. I'm the Jewish Lieutenant Dan, <laughs> although, yeah, I made it out in one piece. Yes, you did. Good. <laughs> Okay, so you always wanted to be in the military, and... I also, I couldn't imagine doing anything else in my 20s, and I was really fortunate in college, I played lightweight football. Yeah. Um, I know you were in also the Ivy a college League, football though. player. In the Ivy League, but my football coach at Cornell was, uh, is, he's still a coach, his name's Terry Cullen, he was a Marine officer in Vietnam, Silver Star recipient, Purple Heart recipient, um, and he was one of the most important mentors and role models in my life, and so he really encouraged me to join the Marine Corps as opposed to the other branches, and I think gave me that extra little push to, to join the military. I think there's, in, in Judaism, you know, being Jewish myself, there's like two schools that I see of like Jewish parents. Yeah. The ones that somehow are related to the Holocaust and see the honor and responsibility, you know, as we do in Israel, right? Mm -hmm. We serve our country. Yeah. And they see that. And then we have the other Jewish parents that we see is like, if there's a draft, my kids are going to Canada. Right. And I, it's very divisive. Um, when you were built into this culture, and, and I will say uh, wh whether or not it's right or wrong, yeah. I think my mom being a single mom with five boys and, you know, no five, like her thing was nothing can happen to my yeah. sons, right? And yeah. she's the principal of the San Diego Jewish Academy, the head of the women's, mm -hmm. like, not afraid of, you know, defending our yeah. culture, but to her, the fear of loss of life yeah. was so difficult. I'm always curious because I grew up in that environment. Mm -hmm. and, I, and to tell you, which was interesting, yeah. we, I, I was in law school and I couldn't afford to be there. My oldest brother passed away and I was gonna join uh, the, our, the, the ROTC mm -hmm. program so they'd pay for four years. Yeah. You know, and my mom, once again, she's like, I don't care what it takes, you're not gonna do this. And I go, oh, we'll never be at war. Yeah. Like, I'm convinced her because, like I said, I'm built like a Marine. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I played college football like right. you, right? Not, this is yeah. all my personality. And she's like, you don't get nothing you for listen nothing. To your mom. And then they pulled all the kids out for Desert Storm. And so not that I was afraid to serve my country or mm -hmm. I, I still, it's something to me. I, I'd be the parent that that's an yeah. honor. And I just believe I think in there's no service. tougher job in the world than being the parent of somebody who's serving, and especially somebody who is overseas. There is no type of job. My mom was in her 60s when I came home from my second deployment to Iraq, which is really the tougher of the two deployments. She's now 71. She looks younger today, 15 years later, than she did when I came home. She's in her 50s then. Wow. Um, and, uh, and I think we don't give enough credit at all you know, to the parents and, and the folks that are actually raising these young men and women who are serving, but yeah, it's, you know, on one hand, I have kids now. I've got, I've got three kids, and I would be disappointed if they didn't serve. I won't be able to sleep at night if they do. What a great conflict. That, that's what I was trying to get yeah. to. Because like, someone that's been there, and yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's, wow. To me, that's huge. Well, anyway, you have quite an experience mm -hmm. while you're serving. And can you share with us the lessons from serving? Because it's not easy to transition back yeah. After you're done, so no matter who you are. Yeah, I think I think the number one is I was really fortunate to have role models, mentors, senior officers, uh, men who I worked with. I was in the infantry, so at that time it was mostly men. Um, who, you know, these were guys like my battalion commanders, a guy named Colonel Willie Buell, and all of us to this day from that battalion love Colonel Colonel Buell. My my first sergeant was a guy named Brad Castle. I had these young sergeants like Anthony Alvarado and 
um, Albert Martinez, and these were guys who were cut from a certain cloth of putting others first, always taking care of your men, um, and I was fortunate to be exposed to that. And I think that was sort of the most important lesson I took away from my time in the Marine Corps, is it's not about you. Um, you have a saying when you're going through infantry officer course, you're going through some of the tough training, it's like nobody cares, right? And it's not your job to, to care about yourself, it's your job to care about everybody else. Um, and I was fortunate to have role models that really lived by that when I was in the Marines. And you obviously live by that as well. I try to, I yeah. try and live up to their standards. I yeah. mean, they, some of these guys set a really high bar. My first sergeant took, um, you know, shielded another Marine from two grenade blasts, and I think I shot seven times in the leg and shielding him. Um, my, uh, one of my platoon sergeants, Anthony Alvarado, uh, got shot storming into a building to help some other Marines. Um, we lost a wonderful young Marine named Byron Norwood who went into a house to go save some guys who were trapped in there. Um, and so, you know, I think when you come home from an experience like that, one of the most important conversations I had when I got, came home from war was with Byron Norwood and Marino, she's talking about his dad. And we went out for barbecue in Texas and, um, you know, Bill said to me, you know, nothing makes us happier than seeing Byron's friends and the guys he served with, starting families, going back to school, starting businesses, enjoying life. And you realize that you have an obligation to make their sacrifice worth something. Um, and I think a lot of the men and women who are coming home from these wars who have served since 9-11, um, they're continuing to serve in other ways. And they're not just doing it because they believe in service, they're doing it to honor the memories of those we lost. Wow. Um, I believe in something called the stage theory. And okay. part of the reason I really yeah. wanted you on here is that I think we're at a revolution as entrepreneurs to understand content mm -hmm. and that there's inspiration that we all have, a frequency that we all mm -hmm. carry from our experiences. And we have a, an opportunity to create a stage around what we know. Unlike, you know, and I, I always joke around with my speaking career, mm -hmm. is that I was so excited when I started that somebody would pay me to speak in front of 500 people. Then I got to be 1,000, and then there's 24,000 at the RISE conference. And, you know, my camera guys following me around is like, Dave, there's 24,000 people. You understand, like, we're about capturing content, amplifying content, and right. distributing content yeah. for perpetuity. Yeah. For perpetuity. And good content that lives in perpetuity. Good content vibrates the fastest, like the Mickey Mouse Club that has 470 million views, <laughs> right? That's old, perpetual content. It's serious stuff. You can change and impact so many millions of lives. Yeah. So. I don't care anymore, Dave, if you're stepping on a stage with three people or 300,000, because one of these speeches could hit 300 million someday. Right. And that's not even close to the 3.2 billion that are on the internet. Yeah. Well, you are the producer of that stage now. And you took your life experience mm -hmm. and motivated you know, an incredible, perpetual idea Tell me your philosophy of how yeah. that all occurred, because it's not the normal course of Yeah, of so life. I mean, I, I consider myself really lucky in the people who I've had the opportunity to interact with. Um, and so when I got out of the Marine Corps, I did a number of things. So when I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, the first thing I did is I went back to Iraq as a filmmaker and made a film about the war in Anbar province. How long were you in? How long were you I was in for six and a half, seven years. Yeah. Um, and so I went back to El Anbar province where I fought as a Marine. Uh, that had suddenly become the most peaceful part of Iraq, and I wanted to tell that story, and so I made a documentary film called The Western Front about that. And that film was not successful. I had an important story I wanted to tell. I thought that the Marine Corps had learned really valuable lessons about the importance of diplomacy, the importance of um, what's called counterinsurgency, which is often not resorting to force as a first solution, of negotiating with a lot of the tribes. How did you pay for the movie? I raised money. Um, so you did? I did. I raised money. Um, I Look, and it was me and a camera guy that went back to Iraq, and then I had a great editor. Like, it was not a big production for the film. Um, and we ended up showing it at Tribeca, but I don't consider that film a big success. And I think one of the reasons it wasn't, wasn't and this will tie, I'll tie this into some of the things I'm doing now, is because I insisted at that time on being the writer, the director, and the producer. And when you do something by yourself 
and you don't, you're not support, especially me, I'm one of the least competent, qualified people in the world. But if you don't surround yourself with good people, and you're not working with good people, um, you're never gonna be successful. And so when I look at some of the things I'm doing now, I, I started a nonprofit um, and a business. Nonprofit, we provide world-class mental health care to Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. It's called the Headstrong Project. And then I also started a business uh, called Grid North, and we're a collection of brands that serve and support the military community. When I look at something like the Headstrong Project, we're now in 22 cities. We have 500 veterans in treatment. I'm one of five co-founders. So it's, whereas I tried to do this film by myself, not successful, starting the Headstrong Project, I'm one of five that has started this organization. It's one of the most successful things I've done, one of the things I'm most proud of. It's successful because I am one of five, and I've got, I get to work with really good people. And the same is true in my business. Yeah, I think the old saying that you're an aggregate of your five closest friends or the yeah. five books you're reading or podcasts you're listening to. Uh, in my own life, when I surrounded myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas is where I had the biggest challenge. What um, lesson did you take back from that first, you know, I'm talking on the entrepreneur yeah. side, on beyond, you know, we need more people? Mm -hmm. Were there other lessons that you took back that caused you to kind of shift your paradigm into a different business and you know the, from the charity to the business side of things yeah I think my dad was also an entrepreneur and one of the things that he always said to me was you know business is not necessarily like life um, often in life you it, you you often have to make a decision and when you make that decision in life like that's it right you make that decision you shut other doors in business you sometimes have an opportunity to keep doors as open as long as you want and you don't need to shut doors and you can sort of Nav take baby steps, um, place small bets. Uh, and so that's how we grew our business. We started off with a job site for veterans. We had a blog that started picking up. Uh, it became one of the most popular news, digital media, lifestyle sites for the military community. We spun it out as a separate site, but that was just placing small bets and suddenly you've got a second business on your hand. Um, and then as other opportunities come, you know, you try and suss them out and you know, don't make big moves that are gonna wreck the business, but also, you know, play small bets. Yeah, under that context, my father, who's a huge entrepreneur as well, he told me there's only one key to being an entrepreneur and starting a business was stay in business, <laughs> right? Which is the same same yeah. advice, really. He said, if you don't start every day as a businessman, say, do I guarantee that I'll be in business tomorrow? Right. And when you answer that question, you're gonna be successful. He said, some businesses have really smart people, Dave, and within eight months, they can be a billion dollar company. Huh. Some, not so smart, within eight years, 80 years, and some even over 100 years. Yeah. But sooner or later, the businesses that stay in business, that put little bets out there, mm -hmm. which my dad was a gambler too, so you love that, <laughs> you know, really are successful. Something will hit. You know, and I think it's important too, uh, with those little bets, I joke around, because I'm a venture capitalist now, yeah. And I joke around and people see me as this now rebounded, huge success, you know, mm -hmm. from being bankrupt. But, you know, in reality, if you have $20 million and you have 10 bets of 2 million, and as an entrepreneur, one of those bets hits at 100 million, you got 20 million in, you made 100, you netted 80 million. Yeah. Meanwhile, I could be the biggest loser in the world as a <laughs> nine out of 10 <laughs> losers. Like nine out of 10. Yeah. Right? One winner. Yeah. And, and I think the same, I see movie funds do this all the time. That's right? what they, that's their model. Right? That's their and, model. And it, it cracks me up because I learned this part of it when I went to Korea, mm -hmm. the CEO of Samsung's first phone, and there was all these businesses that got $2 million, and right. the ones that were successful were the ones that had like rich family members that when they lost it, they had like they just put more they in. put more in <laughs> right they, yeah. so they never were out of business yeah. but eventually like something hits well you make relationships you yeah. change the business to what works yeah you know on silicon valley was google a marketing no it was a it was a search optimization tool right. yahoo was an index yeah you know i mean the, amazon the biggest company in the world remember ladies and gentlemen was an online bookstore Oh, I remember. Right? Yeah. But you get enough money. And people yeah. thought he was insane that he was running at a deficit into the billions because yeah. he, you know, Bezos and has who's a gonna pay for this? I remember people saying, who's going to pay for the shipping costs of shipping books to their house and they can just drive to the bookstore and get them? Right. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. So I, I, lo I love that. Now, here you are in your career. Yeah. What's your next step? 
Yeah, so we, I now run a uh, media group. So we have three brands. We have a higher purpose, a job site for military service members. We work with about 20% of the Fortune 1000, helping them hire military talent. We have Task and Purpose, which is a leading digital media lifestyle site for, uh, for our community. And then on top of that, we just acquired an events business a year ago that does about, we do about 18 events a year for military families around the country. Big partnership with USAA. And so I think, you know, as we look, um, we're looking at other opportunities, both inside the military and veteran space. I'd also like to start branching out outside the military and veteran space. Um, in some ways, when I started a business, I felt like, silly as it sounds like, I needed permission to start a business. I didn't have business acumen, I had military acumen, so I figured, well, if I'm gonna start a business, it's gotta be something I have domain experience in. It might as well be in the military space. I think now, after four years of running my business, I'm ready to, ready for the next step to be outside of the military space, and I feel like I now have the, the chops to do that. Do you feel there's any conflict between being of service, because mm -hmm. your business is like, I believe mine, right? I, I'm totally yeah. of service and making money. Yeah, no, 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 conflict? I think if you can do well and do good, you win. Good. You know, um, I think there's also a misperception about the military community. You know, often we'll talk to employers or advertisers and they, there's this notion of the military and veterans as a community that needs philanthropy and charity. It's just not true. We have lower unemployment, we make more money, we have better jobs. Um, there's an amazing statistic that 76% of 18 to 24 year olds can't join today's military. Right, oh, I, I work with the, trend, uh, I forget the program, but we hire, uh -huh. hire in, it's in, especially in uh, Southern California. Yeah. It the is, talent is remarkable, oh. the talent is remarkable. I mean, when you have the, you know, unfortunately, the past mm -hmm. histories of these kids, yeah, and where they it's in 20. It's what's the percentage again? 76 percent of 18 like to 24 year olds cannot join the military because they're not smart enough, fit enough, educated enough, they have criminal records, history of drug, past use. drug use, right? Is a big so one. it's uh, it's the top 24 percent, and then on top of that, 12 24 percent, it's top 24 percent of, of young Americans then choose to raise their right hand and join the service, yeah, and so it's a really, really small number. Uh, that can join the military. And I think that there's also, we are the most influential community in America. Um, and there's no shortage of brands that have done really, really well through an affiliation with the service, whether it's USAA or Under Armour or CrossFit or you know, you can name a host of others that have really built themselves with an affinity from this, this community. As someone in the military, a content provider in the military, what's the number one thing a civilian can do to show gratitude to someone in the military? I think it's um, it's a great question. I mean, you know, some people would say hire a veteran. Some people would say mentor a veteran. I think it's, you know, like anything, it's just getting to know somebody's story, treating them like a human being. Um, you know, a lot of us are sort of get uncomfortable with the whole gratitude thing. Yeah. You know, and so um, I wonder because I'm one of those people. I don't know if it's wrong or right. I literally, if I see anyone, I'm like, thank you for your service. Right. Which is nice, and yeah. it's appreciated, and thank you for saying it. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I think also more important, I think more Americans should be involved and thoughtful and understanding about what our military is doing overseas. You know, I don't, it, it's not about whether or not you support us being in Afghanistan or in the different countries that we're in, but at least be aware of it, think about it, be able to make an argument about why you think we should be or should not be, but be engaged politically. And I think that is more than anything the way that you can show gratitude and respect for the service member. You have people who are writing a blank check with their, with possibly their life. You have the power of a vote. You know, use that vote and be thoughtful about about what you want these young men and women to be doing with their lives and and representing this country overseas. And that's not about whether we should or should not be anywhere. It's just being about it's about being involved in the process and being thoughtful about it. That's awesome. Well. Zach, you are a compassionate capitalist. Right? <laughs> You're like me, like I make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a yeah. lot of fun. And I look forward to surfing with you at my beach in South I would Michigan. love that. That's, I, I would love that. Very, very <laughs> cool. Anytime you want. I yeah, appreciate sure, it so much. Yeah, thank you. Zach Iskul, Dave Meltzer here with Entrepreneur, The Playbook.